three. I'm trying this uh, lecture recording out for the first time, so I hope it works out. Um, please excuse any type of uh, technical difficulties that I might have. Um, let's see if I can share my screen and we'll get started. All right, so this chapter is on deviance in sports, and we're going to focus on this idea of um, if it's um, out of control or if there's um, just some causes of deviance um, in athletes that maybe are um, specific to the athletes. I think it's also um, important to consider what might cause an athlete to be become deviant and um, we'll explore some of those different cases that we've seen in sport. Um, so on the screen right now, you see on the slide um, some examples of the um, people who have been deviant, some athletes. So we have um, Barry Bonds with steroids, um, OJ Simpson, obviously. Ray Rice most recently was someone who was um, kind of um, – in the media a lot based on um, some of his deviant acts with, um, with his fiance, um, Tanya Harding, she's down there in the middle um, on the center and you might might or might not know the story right there of her. And we have Lance Armstrong, which you just hopefully watch the video of so you can um, kind of know his story. And um, we'll talk more about that when I get back to class next Monday. Um, Pete Rose, if you don't know his story, I encourage you to look it up. Uh, and also uh, Mike Tyson and Marion Jones up here as well. So we wanna take a look um, primarily in this chapter about what is deviance and what what is it particularly about sports that leads athletes to be deviant. Um, <clears throat> And we'll talk about what deviance looks like in sport. Um, is it a real issue or is it just because um, it's a bigger spotlight that we notice athletes who are deviant more? Um, so we'll look at deviance both on and off the field. Uh, we'll talk about what those um, specific definitions are um, as we go throughout the, the lecture. So like I mentioned already, um, some examples of deviance, Lance Armstrong charged with doping, and uh, that was um, a deviant act because it went against the, the social norms and the norms um, that are expected from the public. Um, and then also Ryan Braun, um, this was a few years ago, he won an appeal of a PED suspension that he received in baseball. And um, so those two um, are specific to talking about deviance dealing with uh, drug suspension and performance enhancing drugs. So among collegiate athletes, um, some examples that you might um, recognize of deviance, and maybe you can pick out even specific cases where in the media that you've heard about or maybe even here at the U, um, but Deviance can be anything that goes against the social norms. And so in this case, um, for collegiate athletes, it might be not showing up to practice. It might be rule violations in games. So committing a foul, a hard foul, um, or even um, stepping out of bounds, those types of things, They're, they are violations in games. Um, any use of performance enhancing drugs is another um, example of deviance and um, hazing rookie teammates, binge drinking, fighting in bars. So there we go, a little bit off the court, um, outside of sport, harassing women, sexual assault, cheating in classes, um, and even using painkillers to stay on the field. So I wanted to talk about this idea of um, how we see a lot of deviance among college athletes and specifically in um, college football. <coughs> uh, many of you are familiar with um, the Ohio State 
football scandal. It happened um, a few years ago. And this was um, an article written in Sports Illustrated, and I just wanted to highlight a bit of that. So this article said that 7% of the players in the preseason top 25, which equaled to 204 in all, had been charged with or cited for a crime, including dozens of players with multiple arrests. Of the 277 incidents uncovered, nearly 40% involved serious offenses, including 56 violent crimes, such as assault and battery, uh, domestic violence, aggravated assault, robbery, and sex offenses. In addition, there were 40 charges for property crimes, including burglary and theft and larceny. There were more than 105 drug and alcohol offenses, including DUI, drug possession, and intent to distribute cocaine. Um, and interestingly enough, they mentioned that race was not a major factor. Um, in the overall sample, 48% of the players were black and 44% were white. 60% um, of the players with a criminal history were black and 38% um, were white. Um, in cases where the outcome was unknown, payers, bleh, excuse me, players were guilty or paid some penalty in nearly 60% of the 277 total incidents. So this kind of gives you a little bit of background on um, what's going on in, uh, in college sports in general. And specifically, this was um, looking at college football. And um, my mistake, it wasn't the Ohio State um, scandal. That's coming up in a few slides. See, though, that in um, maybe you're more familiar with this, it's a, a recent experience where um, TCU was under investigation and um, there was a huge drug bust, and there were several athletes involved and um, these athletes were removed from the team. But this is what um, what the coach said about this. And I think it's important that um, we recognize some of the things that they're talking about. So he said, um, to start out, we have an excellent athletics program at TCU. An indicator of that excellence is the fact that we'll not tolerate criminal conduct among our, among our students. So they these athletes were taken away from the, the team. Then he goes on to focus on this word microcosm. He says, our student athletes are a microcosm of society. And unfortunately, that means some of our players reflect a culture that glorifies drug and drug use. That mindset is not reflected by TCU, nor will it be allowed within athletics. Um, I thought that was interesting that the coach used this word um, in talking about how their sport culture at TCU was a a mirror in, a, in essence um, of society. Then he talks about, he says, this situation isn't unique to TCU. It's a global issue that we all have to address. It isn't just about bad decisions made by a small percentage of my team. It's about a bigger issue across this country and world. Then he goes on to say, as a coach, I do the best I can to educate members of my team. We have programs in place that teach student athletes about what they should and shouldn't do and how to be successful in life. I talk to them about how to be students and upstanding men that uphold the TCU name and its traditions. But he concludes with this, at the end of the day, sometimes young people make poor choices. The horned frogs are bigger and stronger than those involved. Some other examples you might be familiar with are um, Barry Bonds and steroids, uh, and also Marion Jones, um, who was a, a star track athlete. She was a sprinter, um, Olympic athlete. Um, her story is very interesting. It's very fascinating. Um, I encourage you, if you haven't already started your 30 for 30s, to kind of look at this um, story about Marion Jones um, and perhaps um, this chapter will provide some, some more insight on that. So here's an interesting um, situation that I wanted to point out because I think that sometimes the discussions that we have about deviance um, focus on these headline players and, um, and we don't often hear about the players that um, don't play a whole lot but may also um, get into some of the same um, issues and be deviant in some way. So um, 
I wanted to bring up the idea here of um, LaMichael James, who was a, a very good and key player in Oregon's success a few years ago. And, um, and I wanted to compare that to this football player over here, um, who was an Oregon State redshirt lineman, and his name was Tyler Thomas. And um, he was um, not very um, prominent in their success at Oregon State. So let me tell you what happened. Um, for LaMichael James, he was charged with menacing, strangulation, and assault after an altercation with his girlfriend. Um, he pled guilty to a single misdemeanor harassment charge. Um, he was sentenced to 10 days in jail, but he didn't serve any time. Instead, he was permitted to wear an electronic surveillance device, and the coach, Chip Kelly at the time, suspended James for one game. And that game just happened to be a 72 to zero outcome win in favor of Oregon over New Mexico. So then let's look at um, Tyler Thomas. So um, police said that they found Thomas naked and intoxicated in a stranger's home. And when he was ordered down on the ground, um, he reportedly went into a three point stance and lunged at the officers who fired stun guns at him <clears throat> to calm him down. So he was charged with criminal trespass, um, criminal mischief and resisting arrest. Um, he said he wasn't convicted of anything but he was dismissed from the team following his arrest. And um, it's, it's interesting to see the difference between the, um, the players, depending on their status on the team and how much of an influence, how much of a role they play, um, what the punishments are. And I'm wondering if that sends a, the right message that we're hoping to send um, to athletes who are, who are clearly being deviant. Uh, so some of the numbers here on the screen talk about um, from January to August in 2010, um, the number of incidents that were um, deviant on um, these collegiate and professional um, teams. So they said that there were 125 collegiate and professional athletes arrested for crimes, um, for serious crimes. They didn't count minor crimes by football and basketball players. Um, there were only a handful of crimes by athletes in other sports, but 70 were by football players. Um, and again, interesting how the coaches handle those, those differences. Okay, so here's the Ohio State scandal. Uh, I wanted to bring this up and you can look up um, the story yourself using that web, um, that website that's at the bottom of the screen if you'd like. But I wanted to just point this out um, because it was a, an interesting, um, oops, sorry, let me go back. Um, an interesting case where some of the players were um, getting paid for memorabilia. They were receiving benefits that they should not have been. And they were um, sit seriously punished. In fact, um, Urban Meyer was, um, a part of the um, kind of he had he was given the team and then he had to enact the punishment. They weren't able to go to a postseason game um, or postseason play for that that first season he was there. Um, so you can see that sports are really um, a, a place where we see a lot of deviance in some cases, and um, and again it's interesting to consider if they're it really goes about goes back to are they just in a bigger spotlight so let's talk about defining and studying deviance in sport um, so deviance occurs when a person's ideas traits or actions are perceived by others to fall outside the normal range of acceptance in a society so think of boundaries um, of acceptance of appropriate behavior and someone who's deviant um, goes outside of those boundaries. They cross the line. Um, and so in some cases, we think of um, formal deviance, which are violations of official rules and laws that are punished by official sanctions administered by people in positions of authority. So 
for instance, formal deviants might be taking drugs, um, using um, illegal equipment, bats, for example, um, or hitting below the belt. Those types of things are obvious, obviously formal deviants. Um, we also see informal deviance, um, which is the idea that violations of um, our deviances, sorry, let me go back. Informal deviance um, includes violations of unwritten customs and shared understandings that are punished by unofficial sanctions and administered by observers and peers. So for example, um, in tennis, um, going for the head, um, it's kind of outside of the norm to try and hit someone in the head while you're playing tennis. Um, undercutting someone in basketball is another um, incident of informal deviance. It's just known, it's an unwritten rule, and it's not something that you do. Um, another instance might be um, baseball pitchers who throw at the, at the head of their opponent. And this might be um, considered something that is natural, um, but in a lot of cases, um, we see that it gets out of hand. Um, we know it's an unwritten rule that you, um, to brush someone off the plate, that you go through that, um, you go through that experience of kind of throwing close enough to their head or to make a point. Um, and then we know that there's retaliation and, and people in baseball kind of know this a little bit better than, than some of the rest of us. Um, let's see, I'm gonna go back to my screen for a second. Um, so we know that sports are different from society. Um, in society, rule breaking is seen as deviant. And uh, in sport, rule breaking is sometimes just a part of the game. Um, you, you may get penalized, but then it's not viewed as deviant. Um, so in sport, the line is a little bit more hazy um, when you're trying to define what is what deviance is or what what can what is deviance <clears throat> so i want to talk for a minute about um how to understand deviance um the first and maybe most important thing that we need to understand is about um that deviance requires understanding norms so for example um a norm is a shared expectation that people use to identify what's acceptable and unacceptable in the social world. And again, we have formal norms, which are official expectations that take the form of written rules or laws. And then we also have informal norms, which are customs or um, unwritten laws. They're sometimes just shared understandings of how a person is expected to think, appear, and act. So diversity um, in sport is wide ranging. And um, so we know that in some sports, it's okay to do some things. Some things are not accepted um, in other sports. Um, we know that also that things that are ex kind of accepted in society are not accepted um, in sport and vice versa. So for example, um, we may see that, uh, for instance, um, it's acceptable um, in sport to argue with a referee. Um, <clears throat> it may be acceptable to call people names if you're a fan in the crowd. Um, and notice on that slide that we, we just looked at, um, the all the signs in the stands that were Kind of tearing Lincecum apart, the baseball player, um, calling him hippie trash, um, asking him if he wants to smoke, and making fun of his teeth. And think about that in a, a normal society, um, because if you go up to someone and you make fun of them and you call them mean names, then it's generally looked down upon in society. And so um, it's interesting to think about that um, a little bit of a paradox in sport we're allowed to do a lot of things that aren't acceptable 
in um, in society. And in society, there's a lot of things that we would do that we wouldn't normally consider normal in sport. So, for example, um, one of the examples going the opposite way, things that are okay in society but not okay in sport are the use of drugs. So, it, athletes are traditionally not supposed to take certain kinds of drugs, depending on the sport, depending on the level. But outside of sport, um, if you need something to get you feeling better, a steroid needs to be prescribed, then that's totally acceptable. So it's interesting to kind of consider um, how those, there's two separate contexts that we need to understand. We need to understand sport context, and then we also need to understand the regular society outside of sports. And, um, and so that's, that's an important thing to, to remember. So let's talk for a minute about um, an absolutist view versus a constructionist view. Um, first of all, um, an absolutist view is not used by sociologists, but it is sometimes used by the fans, by media, and it's often used when explaining other people's behaviors. So, for example, um, an absolutist thinks what's wrong is wrong and that the perpetrator or the person who committed the act is a bad person. On the other hand, we have a constructionist um, viewpoint and this is uh, constructed expectations and sometimes there's no notions of um, deviance are constructed um, based on socially acceptable behaviors. So we know what the norms are. Um, there a range of behavior that's okay. And it's often this idea of negotiation. So you're able to um, negotiate the, the terms of what's acceptable and what's not based on um, those who are, who are looking or talking um, or thinking about the incident. Um, power um, deals with this idea that norms are really influenced mostly by those who are in power. So the norms might change based on um, who's who is kind of setting forth what the the norm is. Um, and then a lot of the behavior we consider normal and within bounds. Um, so deviance is um, in the eyes of a constructionist um, is relatively um, changing and fluid. And what's right or wrong is dependent upon who's looking at it. And it looks a lot of lot in in terms of the person who is uh, thinking about it, who's um, the context that they're in, all those sorts of things play into it. So there's this um, paradox that we need to consider um, in society, um, then we consider deviance a rejection of norms. Um, and in sport, deviance may sometimes be an acceptance of norms. Uh, sometimes it's hard to exist in both worlds, in society and in sport, um, relatively easily. And what I mean by that is that it's hard to be on the, the ice in a hockey game or on the field in a football game and to um, in those sports where there is very physical, it's very violent and and then step off the court and recognize, oh, I don't act like that in society. And sometimes it's hard to make that transition so quickly. Um, but it's important to recognize that most deviance in sport is not because of the athletes are just bad people or they don't have any morals. Um, and that's the kind of the absolutist approach. So I want to introduce to you um, the sport ethic. Um, this is a collection of norms um, that drive sport. And we're going to 
need to understand the sport ethic in order to understand deviance. So the sport ethic is an interrelated set of norms or standards that are used to guide and evaluate ideas, traits, and actions in the social worlds created around power and performance sports. So it might be um, formal norms, it might be informal norms. Um, most of the time the sport ethic deals with informal norms and um, and these are informal, but they're also very powerful. So the sport ethic involves four norms. Um, the first one is an athlete, athlete makes sacrifices for the game. So it gets at this idea of dedication to the game. Um, an athlete accepts risks and plays through pain. An athlete accepts no obstacles in the pursuit of success. And the athlete um, strives for distinction. And these are the four primary norms of the sport ethic. So what we're saying here is we're saying these are things that characterize um, having a sport ethic and you're, be, you're totally dedicated to the game. Um, I wonder if anyone can see um, any issues that might come up with this. Um, so if you are fully embracing the sport ethic, what are some things that might come of it that could be dangerous? Um, first of all, um, the first thing that comes to my mind is injury and, and your health in general and not taking care of your health. And this is gonna be a, a shock to a lot of people um, about how, um, how sports can be detrimental to your health in the long run, especially with football. Um, we'll talk more about that when we get to um, some of the college and, and high school sports chapter. I think it's our very last chapter of the semester. But there's a lot of danger in playing football, especially playing it for a long time, the repeated hits. Um, and if you're not willing to um, play through pain in some of those more physical sports or even in something like figure skating, then you're often labeled as um, not serious about the sport or a baby um, or you're too soft. And all of these things contribute to the idea that I have to play through pain. And so it becomes a cultural norm for us to completely accept pain and just play through it without recognizing that pain tells our bodies that something is wrong. So sometimes we make fun of um, European soccer teams because there's we think there's so much acting that goes on. Um, so I found this um, little um, despair.com saying that said whining. If you expect to score points by whining, join a European soccer team. So I want to um, just give an example of um, Carrie Strug in the 1996 Olympics. And I'm not sure if any of you know about um, Carrie Strug's story. Um, and I'm hoping I can just find it really quick on YouTube. Um, I think I have it saved. Um, she was um, not one of the stars on the Olympics team. Um, at, but she was actually maybe this is sorry. Hang on. I'm going to see if I can just click here. I think this will go. Great. Americans. Yeah, it's Carrie. Carrie is hurt. 
So I think that's a um, a great story. Um, I was watching this at my home. I was 16 years old, and I was loving every minute of it. And, and Carrie Strug became this, and I do with the idea that she played through pain, that she did this amazing thing because she um, was able to deal with the pain and she fought through it. And so in a lot of ways, I really was kind of buying into the idea of the um, 
the sport ethic. But I think that watching that video kind of illustrates some important points. So first of all, she played through pain. Um, they say in the video that she had a moderate sprain. And actually, they found out later that she had torn some ligaments. And she never was able to compete at the same level again. So it affected her health detrimentally for a long, long time after that. Um, also, I, I think it's fascinating that we celebrate um, these types of things so much. And um, they talk about on the video how she's going to be on the cover of every um, newspaper and magazine in America. And she was, and she was even on the Wheaties box. And she just became this kind of overnight hero because of what she did. And it was great. And I, I totally um, bought into it and I still do. It still gives me chills when I watch the video of it. But um, I think it's really interesting to consider the price that we're paying um, to play through pain, to subscribe fully to the sport ethic, to buy in completely. It really makes um, for some serious consequences down the road. <clears throat> I'm going to skip past that. I'll tell you about it later. Actually, let's go back. Um, so I'll tell you about this, and I think I've mentioned it before. Um, so Derek Jeter came up with this idea of his website um, that he wanted to um, create, and it's a, an online magazine called um, The Player's Tribune. And I encourage you to look at it. It's very fascinating. And um, one of his very first um, articles was written by uh, Russell Wilson. And he really took a stand on domestic violence, which is important um, because domestic violence is something that the NFL ha is kind of struggling with. They have a, a bad reputation because so many players are involved in the domestic violence. So this is what R Russell Wilson said about domestic violence. He said, the more we choose not to talk about domestic violence, the more we shy away from the issue, the more we lose. And then another part of his article, this is how he ends. Um, he says, um, I can't fix the world. I can't fix the NFL. I can't, can't change the guys around me. The only person I can change is the one in the mirror. I'm not a perfect person by any means. I'm just a recovering bully. But if we start being honest about our pain, our anger, and our shortcomings, instead of pretending they don't exist, then maybe we'll leave the world a better place than we found it. For those of us in the NFL, there's no excuse for violence off the field. So he really took a stand on this. And, um, and he talks about in the article that he wrote about how he was a bully growing up. And he learned that because he was bigger than a lot of people, that he could um, use that to, to get control over them. And so I thought that was a, a really fascinating article. It's a good read if you wanna take a look at it. I wanna share one other video with you. Um, this is the trailer for the Friday Night Lights um, movie. Um, if any of you have seen it, then you'll recognize some of the the scenes and maybe we can talk about it a little bit more in class because I think it's an interesting discussion to have. Um, but it really gets at the idea of the sport ethic in a lot of different ways. And so we'll um, we'll try and list some of these things as we um, uh, let's see. Yeah, maybe I'll try and list some after we watch the video. We've been thinking about this for four months now. We 
these seniors have been thinking about for 17 years. Well, it's here now. It's time. If any of you have any doubt in your mind, I don't want you to walk through that door. If you should have any doubt in your mind about what you're supposed to do tonight and about how you're supposed to do it. You all have known me for a while. For a long time now, you've been hearing me talk about being perfect. Well, I want you to understand something. To me, being perfect is not about that scoreboard out there. It's not about winning. It's about you and your relationship to yourself and your family and your friends. Being perfect is about being able to look your friends in the eye know that you didn't let them down because you told them the truth. And that truth is, is that you did everything that you could. There wasn't one more thing that you could have done. And you live in that moment. All right, so that's a great example of um, the sport ethic in a lot of ways. And I think I'll actually hold off on having a discussion about this and maybe we'll start with this video clip on Monday when, um, when we get back together and go through this lecture and kind of review some of the concepts. But um, I think that it's important to recognize um, the different parts of deviance, um, different types of deviance, and we'll talk more about those um, next time when we when we get back together. So I think um, for t for now, um, I'm just going to end there. And I want to give you uh, just some last um, things to think about. So think about instances where you have subscribed or bought into the sport ethic and maybe how it's affected you in the long run and how buying into the sport ethic as a culture um, is detrimental to society. Remember in our class, we're trying to think critically. We're trying to um, have an open mind and um, explore some ideas and why things happen from a different perspective than you're used to. So again, I, I'm not saying that sports are a bad thing and that we shouldn't give our full effort. I think that's um, a critical part of sport and that's part of what makes it a a great activity, but there's also some limits. And a lot of times we go above and beyond those limits when we're looking at um, things like playing through pain, um, striving for distinction. And there's a lot of really detrimental things that happen, negative things that happen to us when we fully subscribe to that sport ethic without thought for um, these other considerations. So. That's going to conclude the lecture today. Um, we will catch up um, a little bit more next time, and I'll kind of try and tie these all together for you. Thanks.